On this Wednesday night, the consequences of a COVID explosion. We are approaching a breaking point in terms of our health care capacity. Provinces on the brink consider drastic measures to prevent their health care systems from collapsing as the World Junior Championships are cancelled. Omicron surging in the U.S. The new concerns about New Year's Eve celebrations becoming super spreader events. A stretch of unforgiving cold in the West goes from frigid, it is dangerous, to frightening. A flat tire can turn into a life altering situation. And the race to help a Toronto toddler with a very rare disease. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Colleen Christie. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Another day and more unprecedented numbers in our pandemic. Once again, Quebec has set a new COVID-19 record. The province is reporting 13,149 new confirmed cases today. That's the highest daily case count recorded by any province or territory at any time during the pandemic. Ontario also set a record today with more than 10,000 new infections. The province is also seeing a jump in hospitalizations and ICU admissions. At least five other provinces and territories have set new single-day highs, and those are just confirmed cases. The true number of infections in this country right now is believed to be much higher. Many public health agencies are struggling to keep up with testing demands. And as Abigail Beeman explains, the onslaught of Omicron is forcing many provinces and territories to reconsider their pandemic protocols. At this stage in the pandemic, for me, it's inexcusable. Inexcusable to close school, says this ICU doctor, one of 600 plus to sign this open letter addressed to Ontario's premier calling for a test to stay strategy instead, using frequent rapid tests after exposures. School closures had a tremendous impact on our children, on their physical health with rising obesity and uh, even type 2 diabetes, their mental health, more anxiety, depression, their ability to socialize. No decision yet from Ontario, while Newfoundland announced schools will return virtually and they're limiting visits at long-term care homes. This may not be, and certainly really isn't the time, to have a really good big shed party on New Year's Eve. No one is hospitalized with COVID in that province, while in Nunavut, there are three hospitalizations and a record 74 cases. The territory is extending its lockdown and calling for help from Ottawa. We are approaching a breaking point in terms of our health care capacity. A breaking point, what Quebec is trying to avoid with its controversial move to let some essential workers who test positive back to work. As an absolute last resort, if you don't have enough people to keep your health care system afloat, that would be something that, that could be considered. If we are seeing a uh, quite a substantial strain due to illness on the healthcare system where we're unable to provide care, uh, then, then we need to look at, at these things. We'll certainly do so in the, in the uh, least uh, amount of risk possible. I don't think we can completely rule out uh, that if, if our hospitals were under the most extreme kind of pressure, uh, that we would have to um, modify uh, the self-isolation requirements. Allowing COVID positive people in healthcare settings goes hand in glove with the CDC's move to cut isolation periods in half for most people. I think that Ontario uh, needs to be smarter. Doing a five day isolation with no back to back testing is like having your uh, mask below the nose. It's something also under consideration in jurisdictions across Canada, with workplaces stretched thin by Omicron's extensive reach. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. With Omicron spreading through players, the International Ice Hockey Federation is cancelling the remainder of the 2022 World Juniors in Alberta. The decision comes after a COVID-positive case on the Russian team, which would have meant a third cancelled game in the last two days. Chechia and the U.S. teams were also forced to forfeit. Late last week, the double IHF preemptively cancelled all January events, including the women's under-18 World Championships. In the U.S., COVID-19 cases have soared to their highest on record. The country is averaging more than 250,000 new confirmed cases daily, driven by Omicron. The Centers for Disease Control say the variant now accounts for almost 60 percent of all new cases. As Jennifer Johnson reports, there's concern that number could grow even more because of New Year's Eve celebrations.
The U.S. is reporting another staggering milestone in the COVID-19 pandemic. Over 53 million Americans have been infected. Omicron is now the dominant strain, spreading faster than any previous variant. The Centers for Disease Control is facing backlash after reducing isolation times for positive asymptomatic patients from 10 to 5 days. I wish the CDC had also added in uh, getting a negative test before ending isolation. Complicating the situation, a new study from the Food and Drug Administration found at-home COVID-19 tests are less sensitive in detecting the Omicron strain. So many people who get negative results may actually be positive. But it's still picking up quite a bit of infection. But what we would reiterate is that if you um, have a negative antigen test and you have symptoms, then you should go ahead and get that PCR test. The at-home kits are in high demand as drive through sites across the country run out of rapid and PCR tests at this critical holiday time. We came because we were family gathering for Christmas and one was very concerned that he had it. New York. Healthcare experts are encouraging Americans to reconsider New Year's Eve celebrations as medical systems struggle to keep up with the post-Christmas spread. We are really short-staffed right now. Over the holidays, we work with a skeleton crew as it is. Uh, and then on top of that, many of our healthcare workers are actually out sick themselves with Omicron. New York City continues to go dark. The Nutcracker Ballet is the latest to cancel all performances. Broadway star Hugh Jackman has tested positive for COVID-19. But the city's school district, the nation's largest, says students will return to classes next week while promising greater access to those at-home tests. We need to keep uh, schools open. There are really high prices that we pay as a society when children are not in school. The controversial decision comes as pediatric hospitalizations for COVID-19 are skyrocketing in New York and increasing twice as fast as adult hospitalizations across the country. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Breaking news from New York. After a month-long trial, British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell has been convicted of helping groom teenage girls to be sexually abused by American millionaire Jeffrey Epstein. Jurors deliberated five full days before announcing the verdict today. Maxwell was found guilty of five of six counts and faces years in prison. Her lawyers said she's being used as a scapegoat for crimes committed by Epstein. He died by suicide in 2019. China's foreign ministry says relations with Canada stand at a crossroads. The comments come just days after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau accused Beijing of engaging in coercive diplomacy during a Global News year-end interview. Trudeau suggested China is using its economic heft to play democratic countries off one another. The Chinese foreign ministry is now accusing Trudeau of misunderstanding and miscalculating Canada's approach to Beijing. In Hong Kong, police raided the largest pro-democracy news outlet in the city. Current and former employees were arrested and operations at Stand News suspended. It comes just six months after another independent news outlet was shut down under Beijing's new national security laws. Redmond Shannon reports. Hong Kong police order the deputy editor of Stand News to stop filming them. Their arrival at Ronson Chan's home was coordinated with an early morning raid at the newspaper offices. Police seized equipment and documents and say they arrested seven current and former employees for conspiracy to publish seditious publications. According to local media, they include board member and former lawmaker Margaret Ng and pop star Denise Ho, a former board member. They are the evil elements that damage press freedom. Hong Kong's pro-Beijing deputy leader said these arrests are only about removing politically biased reporting. These are the bad apples who are abusing their position simply by wearing a false coat of media worker. The Stand News website now says the paper has ceased operations. It was the largest pro-democracy news outlet in Hong Kong after the raid and closure of Apple Daily this year. Its jailed founder Jimmy Lai was served additional sedition charges just this week. Ronson Chan had previously expressed his fears Stand News could face the same fate. It's not easy to say that I'm not afraid of the situation. The media crackdown comes after Beijing introduced new national security laws for Hong Kong last year, following the 2019 pro-democracy protests. Local elections this month saw representatives only elected from a Beijing-approved list of candidates. These arrests are definitely statements um, warning the others that if you are keen to do independent media, 
or having news that are critical towards the government, that you would pay the price of being prosecuted. Exiled campaigner Nathan Law says the remaining small pro-democracy news outlets may be next. And also the government may turn the focus on foundations and funds that are helping political prisoners. Law fears the dwindling level of press freedom in Hong Kong may soon approach the levels of mainland China, recently deemed the world's fourth worst by Reporters Without Borders. Redmond Shannon, Global News. A year of extreme weather is ending with dangerously cold temperatures across most of the West. A deep freeze has settled over much of B.C., Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. The unusually cold weather is causing all kinds of problems from frostbite and frozen pipes to cancelled COVID clinics. Heather Urex West has more. The biting cold has been relentless in Calgary. For several homes and businesses in the city, it's been more than the water lines could handle. In the last several days, our fire crews, especially in the downtown core, have been exceptionally busy with burst pipe calls and water-related calls related to the extreme cold weather. On Wednesday, extreme cold warnings remained in place for all of Alberta and much of Saskatchewan, Manitoba and B.C., Many regions expecting wind chill values colder than 40 below. It is dangerous. It's dangerous to people. It's dangerous to animals. And you can get into trouble so quickly. Something like a flat tire can turn into a, a life-altering situation if you're not prepared for it. For the unhoused, the extreme cold can be life-threatening. In Edmonton, shelters have had to mobilize to protect clients not only from the freezing temperatures, but surging Omicron cases as well. A lot of people are, you know, have inappropriate outerwear on or um, have been exposed to the elements in some way. So dealing with a lot of frostbite and um, a little bit of, you know, panic about trying to get in to get somewhere warm. The cold has impacted the COVID fight too. In BC, Fraser Health says hazardous weather conditions forced them to reduce services at 66 COVID testing and immunization centres. Come in all the way from Maple Ridge to Coquitlam just to find out there's a little tiny sign saying we're closed due to extreme weather. The good news is this steep freeze isn't expected to last forever and by the weekend most places across the west will be experiencing more moderate temperatures. Here in Calgary we're expected to hit a balmy high of minus four by Saturday. Colleen? Heather Urex West in Calgary. Heather, thank you. The next phase of Canada's She Session. Coming up, how the pandemic has put new stressors on women in the workforce. Former Senator and Indigenous advocate Marie Sinclair is among the 135 new additions to the Order of Canada. Sinclair, who chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission into residential schools, tops the list along with a popular novelist. Life of Pi author Jan Martel is being recognized for his storytelling and philanthropy. The 2021 honor roll is the first under Mary Simon, who became Governor General in July. COVID-19 has fueled job and income losses for women more than men. And in Canada, the so-called she session isn't over, according to employment experts. Nearly two years into the global pandemic, it's taking a different toll on women. It's impacted their ability to hold down a job and progress in their careers. And Gaviola explains. The pandemic just keeps hitting Melissa Harrod's recently opened axe throwing business. The latest COVID surge has resulted in cancellations and staffing shortages during what should have been a busy holiday season. I tested positive on a rapid test and I'm still waiting for my PCR results. I have been in quarantine for now or in isolation now for at home for 15 days with a four year old and a seven year old. To make everything even more complicated, she doesn't know whether school will be online or in person in January. The childcare options here are very, very limited. There are some after-school programming, but to be honest, they're often very hard to get into. The first year of the pandemic disproportionately hammered women's employment and it took them a lot longer to recover on the jobs front. According to the latest data, women in their prime working years have mostly recovered, but the numbers don't tell the whole story. 
Even though employment levels for women aged 54 and under bounced back close to pre-pandemic levels this fall, the latest wave of COVID restrictions is expected to impact women workers the hardest. Labor market experts say there's a disconnect between the official stats and the real impact of nearly two years of uncertainty and disruption. We actually do see that in the mental health data where we see an increase in problems of people reporting depression and anxiety, particularly among moms. Uh, Canada has had one of the highest rates of school closures, certainly in a province like Ontario, in the world. Um, and that's really had an impact on family and, and like people are on edge right now. It's been a roller coaster. So many ups and downs over the course of the pandemic. Jennifer Hargreaves runs a recruitment firm and sees the impact of the ongoing she session in her line of work. The numbers don't really reflect women's access to opportunity, which I do believe has been limited throughout the pandemic and continues to be limited right now. Labor analysts say this phase of the she session may be the most difficult to quantify and the impact on women's career trajectories may linger long after the pandemic. Yeah. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. App apathy ahead why Canadians lost interest in Health Canada's COVID alert app. Across the country, soaring COVID-19 cases have forced many public health officials to give up on contact tracing. Instead, Canadians are being asked to warn people they've been in contact with to isolate and monitor for symptoms. But there's another tool available, the federal government's COVID alert app. But as David Aiken tells us, it isn't being talked about or used anymore. The premise of the COVID alert app is relatively simple. When people are near each other, their phones exchange and record anonymous numeric codes so that if a person using the app ever became sick with COVID, an alert could be sent to every phone that came near the phone of the infected person. Those alerted can then get tested or self-isolate. But even though Prime Minister Justin Trudeau often encouraged the use of the app, this is literally a tool in your pocket to fight this virus. It never really took off. British Columbia, Alberta, Yukon and Nunavut never signed on. And new data provided to Global News shows declining use of the app through much of the year. 6.8 million of the 30 million smartphones in Canada have the app installed. In April, nearly 6,500 users punched in a code to say they were infected. That in turn generated 35,000 notifications to other app users. But by November, just 869 users told their app they were infected, and that generated 11,000 alerts. Those numbers declined even though Ottawa had spent $20 million promoting its use in radio, TV and online ads. The COVID alert app. Nonetheless, Health Canada continued to try improving the app. Global News has learned that earlier this year, it considered building a QR code scanning function into the app. When a user heads into a venue, like a theater or a restaurant, a user scans a QR code posted at the entrance to the facility. Then, if a COVID outbreak is associated with that venue around the time of the visit, the user is alerted and takes appropriate health steps. Health Canada spent $74,000 to hire a consulting firm to find out what Canadians thought about improving the app this way. 60% liked the idea. Nearly half said it would increase their interest in the app, and about the same thought it would help contain the spread of the virus. But provincial health authorities told Health Canada they were not interested, and so the idea was dropped. So, for now, the alert app remains as it is. The government says it will maintain it, but it has neither plans to improve it, nor any plans to get all the provinces to sign on to the program. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Next, the heartfelt plea to help a Toronto toddler battle an ultra-rare genetic disorder with no known treatment. A Toronto family is issuing a heartfelt plea, taking on the battle of their lives for the sake of their young daughter. The toddler has an ultra-rare genetic disorder few children in the world have, and right now there's no treatment. As Karen Lieberman reports, every moment in the search for a cure counts. Good job! 
Every step Maddie Kilner takes, and each smile is a cherished moment etched in the minds of her mom and dad. She's just the happiest little girl. Everyone who meets her is like, she's always so happy all the time and so smiley. And, she, you know, so we really try to focus on that. What started with a single seizure at four months. Cam and I were just holding hands thinking, what is happening to our poor, to our poor little girl? Has become a life altering disease. In June of 2021, we learned that, that Maddie was diagnosed with a very rare, very serious genetic disorder called SCN8A. It causes severe epilepsy. Um, most of it is drug refractory, so um, the seizures are likely to come back. It's kind of just a matter of when, and it also causes development delays and a high likelihood of development plateauing. The disease gene SCN8A was first discovered by Dr. Michael Hammer in Arizona, who identified it in his own daughter soon after her death in 2011. You know, I, as a parent, and especially as a scientist, you know, just was troubled by the fact that we didn't know what it was. I didn't know if there was another child in the world like her. I started getting emails and then decided to start an online registry. And um, so I started learning about families here and there. And, you know, it went from a few handful. Now we know something like 500 around the world. For Maddie and others like her, the future is unknown. SCN8A makes part of the door that connects the inside and the outside of our brain cells. And so in Maddie's case, the door is stuck open. Whoa. So the Kilners treasure their time with their daughter. She's a happy, beautiful girl, and she's so determined. Um, but there's no, there's no treatment now, and there's no cure. The family has raised more than $80,000 for a first Canadian study to help develop new treatments for SCN8A at SickKids Hospital. But even more funding is needed because research could lead to a better outcome for patients. There must be a way that we can make things better. Um, and that's why we're raising money for the treatment and for, for the study so that we can help in our way. Karen Lieberman, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Colleen Christie. Tonight's Your Canada is the Alberta Legislature in Edmonton, all decked out. There are beautiful shots all over Canada. Please email us yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Good night.